talk about a few more points. All right, so starting with part four, control of ventilation. Uh, let's look at this picture here. Uh, this picture is a really nice picture because it shows what the main control center is. And if you look here, respiratory center is under the control of the medulla oblongata and the pons. So the medulla is the primary center of control, um, but we see what factors influence the medulla. So we can start over here. We have peripheral chemoreceptors. We'll talk about two different types of peripheral chemoreceptors, which are located here, um, the aortic body and the carotid bodies. Uh, we also have central chemoreceptors, um, which are separate from the respiratory control center. They kind of monitor changes in cerebral spinal fluid. We'll look at receptors in muscles and joints. We have stretch receptors in our lungs, irritant receptors, higher brain centers, cerebral cortex, and the motor cortex, um, and then just some other respiratory input. So we'll kind of go over each one of these. But let's, let's first start with kind of the overview of ventilatory control. When you think of ventilation, you just want to think of breathing. Um, so with breathing, uh, we know breathing and pulmonary gas exchange, that's necessary to number one, maintain homeostasis. So when we're at a rested state, um, a nice equilibrium or homeostasis needs to be achieved. When we exercise and when we stop exercising, the body also has to bring us back to homeostasis. So that's kind of the, one of the most important kind of factors of ventilation and gas exchange. Next is to match our tissues need. So our tissues need oxygen and they need to remove carbon dioxide. And so ventilation and gas exchange will try to achieve this. And then we also have to monitor partial pressures of those two gases. So we have to monitor the partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide, as well as concentrations of hydrogen ions. So during exercise, uh, we wanna look at what factors will increase our pulmonary ventilation or just kind of our breathing rate. So we know that with exercise, we learned in part three, there's gonna be a decrease in partial pressure. Um, that's because, or partial pressure of oxygen, that's because the body, the muscles are using oxygen. So it's going to decrease kind of the concentration and the pressure that oxygen exerts if there's a less concentration. Um, but we do have an increased partial pressure of carbon dioxide because the muscles, our tissues, are putting off carbon dioxide as a waste product. So the pressure of that gas will increase. And then we also have increased acidity, which is reflected by an increase in hydrogen ions. So with all three of these factors, that's going to increase our pulmonary ventilation. It's gonna be an involuntary response by the body. Uh, the body is going to increase our breathing rate, our tidal volume, so depth and frequency of breathing in order to obtain more oxygen and then also rid the carbon dioxide and the acidity. So let's look at the respiratory control set center. We already said it's made up of mainly the medulla oblongata, which is located in the brainstem. Um, and this serves as a pacemaker, meaning that it sets a rhythmical breathing pattern. So this rhythmical breathing pattern, um, uh, basically it's this extrinsic control that we have some control over, uh, but if we're at rest and we're in kind of just a, like at homeostasis, we'll notice that our body controls the rate and the depth at which we breathe. Um, there's some control that we have over it, but let's look at what our body does to change this breathing pattern in response to changes in partial pressure of gases. So first we, or not we, um, the medulla will receive input. This input comes from, we have neural receptors and then we have humoral receptors. And we'll look at each one of those in more detail. Um, and we also have feedback from our muscles such as the stretch receptors or mechanoreceptors in the muscles and the joints. And then we also have kind of regulation of chemicals. So we have chemoreceptors that are going to detect high levels of carbon dioxide or high levels of hydrogen in the blood, which will also impact our breathing rate. 
So the next few slides will go over the neural and humoral inputs in a lot more detail. So rate and depth of breathing. We already said that's breathing frequency and then depth can kind of be um, related to tidal volume. So the amount of breath or air we can move per breath. So first we have our chemoreceptors. So we have peripheral and we have central. So with the chemoreceptors, we have peripheral and central. So these are our humoral inputs. Um, if we look at this picture right here, we see an increased partial pressure of CO2. So that's gonna be detected by the central chemoreceptors uh, you see located in the medulla, or med yeah, medulla, and then the peripheral chemoreceptors, carotid and aortic bodies. So let's talk about what those two are there, and I think it does explain it more on the next slide. Um, but the carotid arteries, um, or the carotid bodies are located in the carotid artery. So carotid artery branch off the aorta and they kind of move, kind of travel up to our neck. So giving our head and neck blood supply. And then the aortic bodies, uh, blood being pumped through the systemic circulation. Um, so being pumped out of the aorta. Both of those receptors will monitor changes in blood partial pressure of carbon dioxide and hydrogen levels. And you see what happens once they are kind of detected. So once these receptors are active, they're going to send that information via afferent impulses to the respiratory control center, um, which will activate the respiratory muscles to increase ventilation. Um, that just allows us to exhale more CO2. So that's basically one kind of example about how when there's the chemicals detected in the blood, we are ventilation increases just to rid that CO2. Uh, next is neural inputs. So neural inputs we have, we see up here motor cortex, we see our muscles and our lungs. So the stretch, or let's talk about motor cortex first. Uh, so the motor cortex will basically identify movement. So anytime we start um, exercising, moving our body, uh, that's one just piece of the puzzle. So one piece of information that's sent to the medulla. Um, also, we'll notice, the body will notice the joint proprioceptors um, and then the muscle proprioceptors, so like muscle spindles and GTOs, those will start to fire. They can detect changes in body position. Um, and then there's also chemoreceptors in the muscle sensitive to potassium and then also the hydrogen ions. Joint proprioceptions, proprioceptors are also sensitive to pressure. So just like the GTOs, they can detect any pressure on the body, which may increase ventilation. And then there are stretch receptors in the lungs, which when stimulated will either terminate inspiration or increase inspiration. But let's continue going into more detail. So I know I already mentioned the central versus the peripheral chemoreceptors, but here it is for you, maybe helpful and just kind of looking at it on written down on the page. I'm going to go over it just one more time. So the central chemoreceptors uh, we see located in the medulla. They're basically capillary membranes of the cerebral blood vessels and they're very permeable to CO2. So they readily and quickly diffuses into the spinal fluid, um, which that blood would then see this increase in that partial pressure of CO2. This would occur during exercise. Uh, this will also probably increase hydrogen concentrations due to the bicarbonate reaction that we learned about in part three. Um, and all of that will stimulate an increase in pulmonary ventilation, mainly just to eliminate carbon dioxide. And then our peripheral chemoreceptors are located outside of the central nervous system, located kind of around the heart. So the aortic bodies, we said, um, branch off the aorta, and they basically monitor blood that just returned from pulmonary circulation and about to be pumped to systemic circulation, so pumped through the body. They'll basically monitor um, and respond to changes in the blood partial pressure of CO2 and then hydrogen concentrations. 
And then the carotid bodies, kind of already mentioned, they monitor blood supply to the head and the brain, kind of detecting the same thing, just um, if there's a high concentration of CO2, low partial pressure of oxygen, um, and then any hydrogen ions present. Neural input is, we already kind of said, from the motor cortex. So neural activity in the motor cortex can stimulate this increase in ventil ventilation even prior to the onset of exercise. Um, so just even kind of thinking about or preparing about exercise um, releases certain hormones that may kind of increase motor cortex activity. And then this is picked up and it, our respiration increases. Skeletal muscle, we talked about mechanoreceptors and joint receptors, which mechanoreceptors sensitive to movement, joint receptors were sensitive to pressure. So the stimulation of any of these receptors will affect um, pulmonary ventilation. And then lung receptors, we said that stretch receptors in the lungs, so kind of in the bronchioles, when stimulated, this can terminate uh, inspiration due to the reaching a kind of maximal stretch. Um, and then irritant, so like irritation can increase the lung receptors and the respiratory muscles to increase breathing or coughing um, if there's some sort of irritation present. This next slide here puts everything I just said into a picture, basically. Um, so what I point out here, the respiratory center, this here's our brainstem. So brainstem is right here. The respiratory center in the medulla is here. So this, the structure, the medulla, sends information to the ventilatory muscles. And those ventilatory muscles that we learned in part one is what increases um, the breathing rate. We see the motor cortex, when stimulated, so with movement, will activate the medulla. And then we also see our peripheral chemoreceptors, or the carotid body and the aortic arch. So you can see where those are located exactly off of the heart and how any detection of CO2 or hydrogen will activate the medulla. Um, we also have stretch receptors in the lungs. So when the lungs become stretched or um, our stretch receptors in our muscles and joints, um, that information's also gonna be sent to the medulla. We see temperature, so body temperature increases can affect this. And then here are the central chemoreceptors. And we said central chemoreceptors is specifically in the medulla, and they're just monitoring blood, so blood pH level, the acidity. And all of this is input that you can write about in number four. So I want to know all the peripheral and central chemoreceptors. You can also include the stretch receptors in the lungs, the receptors in the muscles and joints, um, temperature, anything that affects the medulla and causes a change in our pulmonary ventilation. All right, moving on. So this is the next part of part four, and this is the effects of exercise on pulmonary ventilation. Um, so we know that during exercise, capillary gas exchange at the, alve at the alveoli and the muscle tissue must increase to meet the demands of, for oxygen delivery and CO2 removal. So to increase gas exchange, we have to increase pulmonary ventilation. Uh, to augment gas exchange at the alveoli and the active tissue, blood flow through these capillary beds must also be increased. Um, so this has to do with an increase in cardiac output with exercise. So what we're gonna look at is three phases of pulmonary ventil uh, ventilation and the control of that to increase a VLR ventilation during submaximal exercise. So that's why I have submaximal highlighted up here. Um, and if you look at this picture down here, it looks very familiar to a graph that we looked at in chapter three, talking about aerobic metabolism and recovery from exercise. Um, and so I'll kind of refer back to that chapter as we're going over this here. So we're gonna, we have three different phases. So we're first gonna talk about phase one, which the only phase one is just this first red line right here. So that's the only thing we're talking about on this slide. So what I want you to imagine is I want you to, to imagine that you just started exercising submaximally, let's say aerobic. So you're jogging, you're cycling, uh, you're doing something aerobic and you just started. 
you went from rest, and if you look here, this is pulmonary ventilation liters per minute. So at rest, very low pulmonary ventilation, 20 liters per minute. As we start exercising, we're gonna see an increase to around 40 at the very beginning. And that's what phase one is just discussing. So we have an increase to about 40 or so um, during the first few minutes. It's an abrupt increase though. So we have an abrupt increase, remember VE, pulmonary ventilation, due to motor cortical activity and that feedback that it gives the respiratory control center. So your brain, the motor cortex, just it recognizes your movement pattern. And once it recognizes this, it sends that information to the medulla, which will then start to increase your respiratory uh, or your ventilation. We also have feedback from those proprioceptors in our muscles. So the proprioceptors like um, the muscle spindles and the GTOs are also active and they're sending feedback to the medulla. And the feedback from those three areas is going to increase your ventilation from 20 liters to 40 liters per minute. Because in this first phase, we're just in this first red line right here. Now we're in the second phase. So second phase is the green box. Um, you see there's gonna be a 20 second plateau in our breathing rate and then a really rapid increase to reach steady state level due to those previous factors we mentioned on the last slide and now the peripheral chemoreceptors. So I mentioned the word steady state. Uh, that should ring a bell from chapter three. We learned about steady state exercise, which means our oxygen needs are met aerobically. Um, we also learned that the first part of this, kind of where the arrow is circula uh, circling, uh, we learned that was called oxygen deficit. So basically where our oxygen is not being met aerobically. It's before steady state occurs. And then as we see a sharp rise in ventilation and aerobic metabolism starts to kick in, we then reach a level of steady state. So we said it's due to the muscle joint receptors and then also the motor cortex, but now we have the peripheral chemoreceptors. So peripheral chemoreceptors, we said, were the carotid bodies, the aortic bodies, responding to chemical changes going to the body and then going to the head. Um, we want to make sure that those, the blood is be, um, deficient in hydrogen, so has very little acidity. Uh, and then we also want to make sure that there's not too much CO2. So basically, those receptors will also increase pulmonary ventilation, but we see eventually we'll hit that plateau. Now let's look at phase three. So phase three, we're still at steady state. So when you follow this blue line, we get into phase three, which is this, um, what would you call that color? Peach, tan, orangish color right here. Um, so fine tuning of ventilation. So the fine tuning, we have now started using our central uh, pro, uh, chemoreceptors as well as the peripheral. Again, this is just to match the demands of exercise. What are those demands? The body needs continuous oxygen. So the body needs oxygen and it needs to get rid of the CO2. So fine tuning ventilation, making sure that our ventilation is appropriate for the submaximal exercise that we're doing. And then let's say after phase three, we stop our exercise. And you notice that pulmonary ventilation does not um, completely go back to baseline in those first few minutes. It will take a little bit of time. And if you remember from chapter three, that's called EPOC. So excess post oxygen or post exercise oxygen consumption, where we're still consuming a lot of oxygen. We see 60 liters per minute um, while we're trying to recover. And then slowly we'll move down to 40 and then 30 and then eventually back to 20. Um, but once we've stopped exercise, there is a removal of all feedback when the exercise ceases. Um, this is going to decrease pulmonary ventilation. We will experience that epoch, but just remember that's to cool down the body, to clear away acidity, and to decrease any excess carbon dioxide in the muscles.
but let's jump to this next slide. If you look at that purple box at the top, now we have near maximal exercise. So near maximal, um, we are close to our maximal potential. So what happens in this instance? So you see that if exercise exceeds 50 to 60% of VO2 peak, which VO2 peak is similar to VO2 max, so the maximal amount of oxygen you can consume uh, during a given time period, we see that phases one through three have been surpassed. So we've already passed those. There was no reaching steady state. Um, we just kind of jump all the way to stage three. And you're like, well, wait a second. If we jump all the way to stage three, well, there's no stage left. There's no stage four. Well, what's happening here is due to that rapid increase in pulmonary ventilation, um, it's disproportionate to our exercise intensity. You're having to ventilate more air just to obtain one liter of oxygen. So this is out of proportion um, to the increase in pulmonary ventilation relative to the increase in exercise intensity. But what does this do to? So why is there this disproportionate increase in pulmonary ventilation? It's due to the acidity. Um, so when we have an increased acidity, we have a decreased pH above lactate threshold. Remember, this is near maximal exercise. So basically you're doing a maximal sprint. Um, so high intensity anaerobic exercise for a very short time period. Uh, when this occurs, your body basically can't catch up uh, your breathing can't catch up with your exercise intensity, um, again, due to the acidity above lactate threshold. So what happens in this case? We have the stimulation of our peripheral chemoreceptors to increase pulmonary ventilation. So peripheral chemoreceptors, remember that's the carotid bodies and the aortic bodies detecting chemicals uh, going to the body and going to the head. The peripheral chemoreceptors actually respond quicker to an increase in um, hydrogen ions compared to the central chemoreceptors, which have a slower response. This is due to the hydrogen ions being less permeable to capillary membranes of the cerebral blood vessels. So the central chemoreceptors are not um, as efficient, we'll say, as the peripheral ones are. So peripheral chemoreceptors respond faster. Uh, so that's why these receptors are gonna be the primary receptors increasing pulmonary ventilation. What does this allow for? The body to exhale that excess CO2 and that helps to decrease the acidity. The increase in ventilation um, is gonna also be due to increases in norepinephrine um, so norepinephrine and epinephrine, so our fight or flight response. I mean, think about it. If you're sprinting as fast as you can, your body doesn't know the difference between running a race or running away from danger. Um, so those hormones are also going to be present. Um, and body temperature is going to increase rapidly as well. And so that's another factor that increases our breathing. All right. Now let's move on to another topic uh, called ventilatory threshold. So what are ventilatory equivalents? Um, this is the amount of air that we have to ventilate to obtain one liter of oxygen or to expire one liter of CO2. Because remember, we know the air is not 100% oxygen. Uh, it's mostly nitrogen and then just a smaller percentage of oxygen and then a very small percent of CO2. So we have to ventilate more air to obtain a certain amount of oxygen. So let's talk about what those ventilatory equivalents are. Um, so we see here ventilatory equivalent of oxygen. So it takes a ratio. So it takes a ratio of pulmonary ventilation, so how much air we're actually ventilating to basically the amount of oxygen that we're able to achieve. So what I want you to write down here, so to take notes, is um, at rest for a healthy adult, we have to ventilate 28, no, wrong, 26 liters of air to obtain 
one liter of oxygen. So the number you want to put here after this equal sign is 26 liters. And you're like, I, what does this 26 liters mean? Uh, we have to ventilate 26 liters of air to obtain one liter of oxygen. What about CO2? Um, so the number is going to be a little different here. So now this is talking about how many liters of air do we have to ventilate to get rid of one liter of CO2. We have to ventilate, the number you want to write down is 33. So we have to ventilate 33 liters of air to expire one liter of CO2. So it's just a ratio. It's just a ratio, the VE, so it's for oxygen, it's 26 compared to one, and then for CO2, it's 33 to one. So it's just, we have to ventilate X amount of air. We breathe in this many liters of air to obtain this many liters of oxygen or get rid of this many liters of CO2. And what are these numbers used for? So why do we care about these numbers? Used to find ventilatory threshold. So what is ventilatory threshold? Uh, it's used to estimate lactate threshold and it indicates what factors help control pulmonary ventilation. So it's very similar to lactate threshold and we're going to talk about it on the next slide. So ventilatory threshold workload at which there's an increase in the ventilatory equivalence of oxygen, but no change in the ventilatory equivalence of CO2. Uh, that's shown in this picture down here. So we have an example of running speed. As we run faster, we're going to be breathing heavier. So our pulmonary ventilation will increase as our intensity increases. So let's look at the blue line first. So it says no change in the ventilatory equivalence of VCO2. That's what we learned on the last slide. So we're still ventilating the same amount of air to get rid of one liter of CO2, even as intensity increases. Uh, but look what happens when we hit something called anaerobic threshold, which is, it's really just lactate threshold. Um, and it looks, it has the same picture that we learned about in chapter three. So with lactate threshold, we had this rapid increase in blood lactate at a certain point or a certain intensity. So that's kind of what ventilatory threshold is. It's now where we have to ventilate more oxygen or more air to obtain one liter of oxygen. So we see here that the ventilatory equivalent increases at a certain point and increases rapidly. So now we're ventilating more air to obtain more oxygen. Um, this occurs mainly at a workload of 50 to 60% of VO2 peak in the untrained individuals. And it occurs at higher intensities in trained individuals, especially our endurance athletes. So this is similar to where the lactate threshold occurs. If you go back and look at those graphs, kind of the most important variable that is kind of increasing or controlling pulmonary ventilation is the plasma PCO2. Again, we're basically ventilating the same amount of air to expire one liter of CO2 even as more CO2 is produced by the working muscles, but we're increasing the amount of air ventilated to obtain one liter, liter of oxygen. Uh, so breathing has basically surpassed the normal pulmonary ventilation rate. Another statement here that you'll definitely relate to is once intensity increases where aerobic metabolism cannot keep up with the energy demand, it switches to anaerobic. So let's explain this. Um, aerobic exercise, aerobic metabolism, it produces a, a huge capacity of ATP, but it produces it at a very slow rate. So if we're increasing our intensity, that means we need energy at a fast rate. So we need more ATP in a shorter time frame. That's when we have to switch back to anaerobic metabolism as the intensity gets higher because we need more ATP. Um, there's an imbalance between ATP need and ATP production when using aerobic metabolism. 
Um, this causes an increase um, in muscle acidity and plasma. And when we have that increased acidity with anaerobic metabolism, uh, we, and we have an increase in pulmonary ventilation. So VT, again, is ventilatory threshold. Another definition, it's the point at which the body switches from aerobic to anaerobic respiration. And again, you think, why is that? It's switching from aerobic to anaerobic uh, because we need ATP, we need energy at a faster rate. Um, aerobic metabolism can't keep up with high energy demand. It can produce a lot of energy, but at a, it takes a longer time. With high intensity exercise, we need energy rapidly. So ventilatory threshold, body switches back to anaerobic respiration, but now we have an increased acidity. And with that increased acidity, our ventilation increases even more to get rid of those hydrogen ions. So that's kind of the basics of ventilatory threshold. You don't have to know much more than what's on this slide here. Um, and same with ventilatory equivalents on the last slide, you really just have to know what was on the slides and what did I tell you about those numbers. We just have a few slides left. Um, let's look at ventilation limits. So these are the limiting factors to our pulmonary ventilation. Let's read this sentence right here. Uh, we see we have an increased ventilation frequency. Um, it's gonna increase as oxygen need increases. Um, that's the need of the respiratory muscles and the diaphragm. What shows this? We have an increase in AVO2 difference in the venous blood from the respiratory muscles. So a way to kind of sum this up is as exercise intensity increases, so does our pulmonary ventilation because an increase in both tidal volume and breathing frequency. So higher intensities of tidal volume tends to plateau. So the only way to further increase um, pulmonary ventilation is to increase um, breathing frequency. But when we increase breathing frequency, the respiratory muscles have to work harder. And if those respiratory muscles are working harder, uh, they're going to be using more oxygen. So these muscles uptake more oxygen from the blood with an increase in intensity. That's gonna increase AVO2 difference. That's the difference in the oxygen content between the blood, um, the arterial blood passing through a muscle and the venous blood leaving that muscle and returning back to the heart. So this is the same thing as with muscle tissue. There's an increased AO, AVO2 difference in a working muscle during exercise. Um, same with the diaphragm and the respiratory muscles. So that's really all this one is saying here. Next one is talking about um, the diaphragm force output. So this is in trained and untrained individuals. Our diaphragm has a certain amount of force that it can withstand, and after that it hits exhaustion. So we see the force output decreases at exercise intensities above 80 to 85% of VO2 peak all the way up until exhaustion. That's a really high intensity. This is not saying your diaphragm is going to give out at submaximal exercise um, or even pretty high intensity. This is near maximal. So basically these exhaustive intensities greater than 80% um, or sorry, less than 80% show no decrease in force output. It has to be at 85% or 80% or, or greater. Um, we see a decrease in the force output of the diaphragm, but it can still perform most of its functions aiding in ventilation. So it can still aid in our breathing, but the force it produces is a little bit less. But what happens in this case is the accessory ventilatory muscles are going to be activated at higher intensities. So this is gonna increase our breathing frequency and compensate for a decrease in tidal volume because the diaphragm has less force output. Next is increased oxidative capacity of those respiratory muscles with endurance training and COPD. So this is basically due to the extra work of breathing required. So think about endurance training. The body is having to work extra. Um, those respiratory muscles are working overtime. 
compared to a tra an untrained person. So the oxidative capacity, that's basically the aerobic metabolism is going to increase of those muscles that are used. And then you ask why would a COPD patient experience the same thing? Uh, COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So with an increase in airway, airway resistance, um, that's gonna stimulate an increase in oxidative capacity of these muscles. Because if we have a decreased resistance of the airway, or sorry, increased resistance of the airway and then decreased diameter, the respiratory muscles have to work harder to obtain more air or to obtain more oxygen. So again, the respiratory muscles are working overtime, increasing the oxidative capacity. All the enzymes in those muscles that rely on aerobic metabolism, those are going to be more effective. Uh, but there's no change to the glycolytic enzymes with endurance training or COPD. And then last here is the diaphragm. The diaphragm can also hypertrophy, just like any other muscle. Um, what causes it to hypertrophy? It's going to be physical labor or weight training, not aerobic exercise. So aerobic training does not cause hypertrophy of the diaphragm, but physical labor weight training does. What happens here? We have an increased thickness. So the diaphragm, remember, is a flat dome-shaped muscle. So we have increased thickness of the diaphragm and it's stronger. We have increased force producing ability. One more thing I wanted to show over here, which I thought was interesting. Um, we have four different muscles. We have the diaphragm, the intercostals, scalenes, and transverse abdominals. All those muscles are involved in inspiration and expiration. And so with blood flow, this is the amount of blood flowing into the muscle. So rest, and then we see maximal exercise. So rest, the diaphragm works the most. We also see maximal exercise. We have an increase in all three of the muscles, but the diaphragm to the greatest extent. And then hypoxia and hypercapnia. So what is hypoxia? That's the presence of oxygen um, or sorry, not the presence, the absence of oxygen in the blood to sustain functions. So lack of oxygen. And then hypercapnia is abnormally high CO2. So what this kind of dotted box is depicting is lack of oxygen, but high level of CO2, what happens? We have an increased blood flow to the diaphragm because it's working harder and harder to obtain oxygen. Um, again, another reason why the diaphragm undergoes a lot of adaptations. All right, so that's kind of made, that's kind of all of chapter seven. Um, we were in class going to do a critical thinking. Um, the question is looking at the adaptations to the respiratory system with an elite athlete. So elite athlete, what's gonna happen? Um, to all of these structures right here. My example was Michael Phelps, so a swimmer uh, with high volume, high intensity training. So normally I would have y'all go over this, but I kind of do want to give you a few points here. So structures in the lungs, you kind of have to understand what happens to the alveoli. We're actually going to see an increase in number. This enables greater gas exchange. Uh, so that's going to increase the surface area of the capillaries, which allows more blood flow, greater oxygen uptake. Respiratory muscles, we're going to have an increase in strength and endurance of the diaphragm and the intercostals to increase um, just the ability to work under those training conditions. And they're going to be more fatigue resistant. So all those respiratory muscles for inspiration and expirations will adapt. Uh, gas exchange is increased, so we have great, greater, sorry, greater gas exchange um, because pressure gradients become larger. There's going to be more oxygen used in the tissues and more CO2 produced. So we're going to have a greater difference between the two, um, between those gases, resulting in greater gas exchange. Tidal volume is going to increase. That's kind of refers to depth of breathing. So increased depth of breathing. Um, same kind of with lung capacity or vital capacity. That's going to increase over time, allow for greater quality of air to be ventilated uh, due to increased ability for those lungs to expand. Um, and just total pulmonary ventilation. Um, 
breathing frequency would decrease because the body's more efficient. So frequency would be lower, um, but intensity, or so not intensity, um, but tidal volume and ventilation would be greater. Next, here is your quiz seven review. So you can pause this video and take a picture of this. Um, so you'll be able to um, take your quiz. Next, uh, we do wanna talk briefly about exam three. So there will be a separate uh, review for exam three posted that just kind of gives you points on what to study and focus on. But I have this slide right here for chapter six um, because exam three is only over chapter six and seven. Um, I'm not giving you the answers to these questions, but you should be able to answer them based on knowing or listening, watching chapter six videos. Um, so I do suggest trying to answer these as best you can because you'll have multiple questions about each of these topics. So you can pause this video, take a picture of this. You may already have it actually, I'm not sure. Um, and answer those questions. And then here's chapter seven. Again, you may already have this, um, but you wanna be able to answer all of these questions, um, describe it in detail. You'll have multiple choice and true false questions uh, over these points here. Um, but that's all I have for chapter seven. If you have any questions, please send me an email. Um, I would be happy to respond to you. And then look out for the exam three review to be posted.